Thanks, Scott. Appreciate it. Uh, first and foremost, I uh, want to thank the NSCA for, for hosting this event. And it's in Vegas, so that's a really good thing. Uh, and so today, if I go off script, it's because I've taken advantage of all the extracurricular activities you can do in Vegas. So just give me like, like that, and I'll jump back in, and I'll get back on point with this, OK? But uh, thank you, NSA, for doing this. And throw a challenge out to you guys. Uh, this conference is obviously a great opportunity for us to increase our knowledge base. But do yourself a favor. Get outside your circle of friends and find one person, one other person to build your network with other coaches. Uh, this is what these conferences are about. And if you leave this conference and you don't do that, I think you do yourself a disservice. And it's a shared profession, right? Somebody says they came up with something exclusively, they probably learned it from somebody else and maybe just put a couple little tweaks on it. So do yourself a favor and uh, take advantage of that and build your network and grow that. With the DWMA, I have, how many guys to do a movement screen? Show of hands. Okay, great. I, I started off, developed the system back in 2006. Prior to that, in 2002, I did the, did the FMS. And the FMS is great. It's a great uh, summit of assessment to see where your athletes are at. The problem that I had was I could not increase the rate of frequency from which I tested my athletes. One, two, I had to limit training time or reschedule training time in order to accommodate a way to my athletes. So I wanted to, I came up with this system to increase the rate of frequency from which I'm working with the athletes, understanding how well they're moving, and at the same time, didn't have to take away from any of the training time that we were allotting. It's probably the most precious commodity as a strength coach. I don't need a bigger weight room and I don't need more weights. I just need more time. And the NCAA and the head coaches are always monopolizing that for me. So um, today, obviously, going to go through some methodologies, some principles behind what, why we're doing this. I'm actually going to show some stuff up here, too, so I'll have to ask for some volunteers. But then we're going to do a thing at uh, 1 o'clock where we're going to really go through this and get really in depth. And so I invite you guys to come there, be a part of that. It's going to be in the exhibit hall. And uh, we'll really be able to actually assess, correct, and reassess very, very quickly and easily. So hopefully see a lot of you guys in there. So what's the difference between a high-performance sports car and a high-performance sports athlete? What's the difference between a pit stop and a warm-up, training, injury assessment, okay? And my point being is this, both the race car and the human body are highly complex machines that need constant evaluation in order to maximize performance and minimize mechanical failure, right? So that's my approach with my athletes. So I, I ask them, I say, what are you guys? Are you guys a dump truck or are you a Ferrari? What do you think my athletes say? Oh, coach, I'm a Ferrari. It's like, yeah, okay, awesome. I think you're a Ferrari too. That's why you're here. You wouldn't be here if you weren't a Ferrari. But guess what? I'm your mechanic. The weight room is my garage. It's where I get to fine tune you. The practice court is my test track, okay? And that's how I approach, approach that work with my athletes. You wouldn't take a race car leave it in the garage or park it there for months on end and then pull it out the day of the race, put it on the start line and expect that car to run at peak performance, right? No way it would. There are, let alone when, there are months, weeks, days, minutes, seconds leading up to that race where that car is being fine-tuned to maximize its performance. And so that's how I approached what I do with my athletes, is we're constantly fine-tuning them. And at the end of the day, I think the easiest thing to do in our profession is to make the kids strong and make them tired. The question is, what you're doing in the midst of doing that, are you making them better? Are you making your athletes better? So when I get up in the morning and I get to kiss my wife and my daughter and I go to work, I know going to work that I was hired to make my athletes the best versions of themselves. 
to make them so much better than they even thought possible that they could be, right? And in doing that, they need constant evaluation, right? And again, I think the easiest thing in the world is to get a guy stronger and get a guy, make a guy tired. The question is, are you making them better? And this system has allowed me to be able to constantly evaluate my athletes just like I would a high performance sports car in a, in a time frame that's not gonna take away from training. So quickly, let's look at this and, and just define what exactly is a dynamic warmup. So it's a series of movements designed to actively prepare the body for performance, okay? Whether that's practice or competition. Movement assessment. It's a set of unique movement patterns designed to identify muscle imbalances and weaknesses in the body's kinetic chain, okay? Whoops. This is the kinetic chain. And again, the DWMA allows me to be able to assess this ground-based sequence of mobility and stability sequences. It allows me to be able to do it at a rate of frequency much more often than what I've done with traditional movement screens. And more importantly, I'm able to actually even look at a lot what's going on right down here. Everything we do originates from what? The ground up, run, jump, sprint. And what I have found is if I've spent more time working and looking from the knee down, it ends up cleaning up a lot of this stuff up here. Because if it's broken down here, this up here ends up compensating. That's where we see the injuries occur or lack of performance or compromising in performance. And if these things go unchecked, unregulated, then immobilities, stability, flexibility, performance, all those are gonna end up being compromised and unfortunately potentially could end up leading to injury. So again, developing this system allowed me to be able to increase my rate of assessment looking at these kinetic chain mobility stability continuums. So, how many of you guys do a dynamic warm up? Okay, keep your hands up, keep your hands up. How many of you guys, I've already asked this question, but I want to see the hands come down. How many of you guys do a movement screen? Okay, how many of you guys do a movement screen? Let's add it even more here. Keep your hands up. One time a year, do a movement screen. Two times a year. Once a semester. Once a week. I need to talk to some of you guys. That's pretty good. All right. And, and why is it? Why is it that we're not doing it? What's the pink elephant in the room? What's well, the number one reason why we can't increase our rate of frequency with a movement screen? Time. Again, it's my most precious commodity. I don't need a bigger weight room. I don't need more weights. I need more time. Okay? So, in a time starved schedule, it allows me to be quickly assess these guys, assess their kinetic chain, and then more importantly, be able to apply corrective with that athlete to bring them up to speed. So, you guys want to go through some of these exercises? Do I have any volunteers? We got a little bit of a limited space here, so I think maybe I'll pick two people, and we'll just kind of do it right down the middle here, I think. And you guys can kind of stand up, get yourself in a position where you can see these movements and what we're looking at. Does that sound good? Two, two volunteers. Come on up. Come on up. If somebody else wants to come, we can get more. I could usually have a team to do this, so it's okay. If anybody, if anybody else wants to get up there and do it, come on up. Cool. So when my athletes come in, Typically, we start with our shoes off. I'm not gonna ask you guys to do that, but the question always comes up. Do you do these barefoot? Yes, we always come in and we're doing some sort of lower, lower quarter mobility, stability, strengthening piece. And then their shoes are already off when they do that, so when we get right into it, we're able to do this. And be, if anybody came from Lauren Landau's talk, it was excellent. Kind of talked a little bit about that ground-based sequence, that kinetic chain. And it allows you actually able to see how the foot's reacting to the ground. What kind of pronation, supination's happening 
with that foot and what kind of stability. Extremely important in terms of performance and obviously extremely important in terms of being able to decelerate, redirect that force and be, and be able to uh, change direction. Are right, you guys ready? So these are our 10 movements. I don't do all 10 movements every single time. And we'll get into that the, in, at the one o'clock group, but we'll go through all of, not all of these, but we'll go through a select group of those. And a lot of these, some of you guys have already seen, some of you are like, man, I already do that, but I never really thought of looking at some particular things and using it as an assessment. What I end up doing is, I have like a checklist, and you guys can make one on your own, but I'm looking at specific things with the athlete. If you've got a group, you can literally just check them off where you see imbalances. So instead of doing an individual programming, which probably isn't capable of because the mass of athletes, some, ath some coaches are seeing 600 athletes a day, especially at the high school level. This is what allows you to look at a global problem and be able to apply it globally to a team, to a group, to a group session, however you'd like. Okay, inchworm. Inchworm's gonna be like this. Everybody's probably seen this, but I'm just gonna walk the hands out, have the athlete come down here, arching up here just like so, looking at that lumbar extension, that abdominal extension, hip extension. If the athlete has any pain in the back at this point, I just tell them to stop and refer them right in to see the athletic trainer, okay? From here, walking the feet up to the hands. Most of my athletes get to this point, and they stop, or they start bending to get to that point. What do we see that? What's probably a limited flexibility at? Where's the, where's the, where's the problem? Hamstrings, right? Pretty simple. You guys ready? You guys ready to evaluate? Two people up here. And then we'll have two other people come right behind them as they go. So once they pass this, uh, that circle right there on the carpet, you guys can start. So check these folks out. Let's see what they got. No pain, right? Everything's good, walk it up, walk the feet up to the hands. If the feet are walking, the hands are still. If the hands are walking, the feet are still. Good job, guys. Excellent. Next group up. Pretty good. I'll let my athletes come up onto their fingertips as well. I'm okay with that. I got like the world champion flexible people here. This is pretty good. Any, any inflexible people, feel free to jump in. That would be fantastic. It would make for a much better. You tight, man? Awesome. My man. All right. Jump down here. Okay. So arch that back up. Any pain there? Good to go. Walk those feet up. Oh, yeah. That's what I'm used to looking at right there. That's nice. Yes, sir. You feeling that? Good. Keep going. It's a warm-up. Good job. Good job. Where the heck did I put my clicker? It's like my cell phone. I can never find it. It's on the chair? Okay. You guys are awesome. My wife's not here, so she can't tell me where I, last time I put my stuff. All right, so we're looking at these things right now with these athletes. Perfect. You guys are good. You guys are good. Stop right there. You guys can stay down there. Looking at hip flexion, hamstring extension, soleus extension. Looking at these things. Something real simple. And a lot of these kind of repeat because I'm going to have a group of athletes. Keep going, man. Keep going. You good? You feeling that? You feeling that? Come on. Excellent. Everybody just line up back there behind them. Perfect. Awesome. All right. Any questions on that? Pretty simple. Next one. Straight leg hip hinge. Okay. Or bent over straight leg or whatever. I've even changed some of the names up because some of my kids... It just seemed, oh, yeah, I know what that one is. Coach changes it up to a little bit more simple. But, and I don't reach to the ground anymore, okay? I just now, I just have the athlete bending over into this table position. I tell him, I cue him, I said, I want your toe pointed down. I want the toe pointed down. What you'll see lots of times with athletes is they'll do this. The toe will come out to create this, the lack of stability and strength in the hip here. So what do they do? They point their toe out. I say, toe down, straight leg balanced, Balancing leg straight, excuse me, opposing leg straight. So now we're looking at an agonist antagonistic pull two. A little bit more dynamic, a lot better. And here, I say I want to be able to throw a tablecloth over your back and eat my lunch on it. I want you to be flat back. And all you're doing, every step is a stretch. Every step is a stretch. Very simple. Okay? Hip hinging. A lot of my kids come in, they can't even do a hip hinge. 
right? You have obviously got to teach them how to do that. This is a way to enforce that and obviously be able to see some deficiencies. You guys ready? All right, I'm ready for my all-stars right here. It's, I got to have an all-star group right here. Ready? Go. Guys in the back, be careful. I don't want you to wear a shoe or a foot. Excellent. And again, these guys went barefoot, so you can kind of see what's going on. A lot of supination, pronation going on with that foot. Obviously, we're reinforcing that. And it's nice to go barefooted. The foot, the shoe kind of anesthetizes a lot of the sensations in the, with the foot. So doing this barefoot helps strengthen and reinforces that as well. All right? You guys are like all-stars. Get up here, man. <laughs> Get up here. We got to go. Good. Working on it. Good. Ready? Let's do it. See that balancing leg? See the toe? Hopefully not. Mm-hmm. That side's a little better. And you'll see that. You'll see muscle imbalances. Sometimes inherently because of the sport, you're going to see those imbalances. See a lot of that right there. Try to keep the body straight. Don't fold at the waist. Don't fold at the waist. Keep the, everything. So think about this as like a gear. So the moment that I start to do this, this leg's going to move. Don't do this and then kind of kick that leg up. That all happens and hinges together at the same time. Not bad. Try to get that opposing leg straight. So the trail leg straight. Ideally, leg should be straight behind. Correct. Ideally, that is correct. Yep. Straight, toe pointed down. How badly are they compensating? You can watch their, their hips and stuff too because if they lack the strength and stability in the glute, what happens? They twist it out. They're athletes. Great athletes compensate. All right, excellent job. That's good, guys. All right, if I could have pick one DWMA movement, this is like, this is like the grand poobah of them all right here, okay? A lot of things going on with this. So I'm going to look at the downward dog heel raise. All right, don't let me forget where I put this. All right, good. So the downward dog heel raise, we're going to get down into a plank position. We're going to come down, do a push-up. A lot of freshmen come in, this is my push-up, okay? All right, so I'm going to look at the push-up. What kind of core strength do I have? Then from here, I'm going to push into a downward dog. I'm going to look at soleus extension. What kind of extensibility here do I have? More importantly, how much shoulder flexion could I get into? If I get a guy that goes into this right here, and this is the best that they can do, probably not going to start off with overhead squat work with them, right? They lack the T-spine extension and flexion to be able to do that. And then more importantly, I want to look back here, what kind of extensibility do I have in this posterior chain back set? So this is hamstring, soleus. I'm connecting it all together. I raise that heel up. I want to be in a straight line. Again, you'll see a lot to, to compensate. What they do, they lift their leg out here. When I'm up here, then I swing that leg through. All right. They can come up on their fingertips. I want the foot straight down, right, looking for hip flexion, hip mobility to be able to come up into this position. Lots of times my athletes do this. This is all they can get, right? I want to be able to come through, step, walk the hands out, right back into a push-up. Don't bring the leg out to the side. Swing it up and through. If you want to add a hip mobility, you can just leave the foot on the ground. You can push that knee out and then work it in that way too. So you can add a little bit more, a little bit, couple different layers that you're adding into that. You guys ready? Downward dog heel raise. My yoga people should love this. You ready? All right, push up first. Pretty good, drive the heels in the ground. Right leg up, swing that leg through. Excellent, walk the hands out. There's my all-stars. Here we go, brother. Yep, be careful. Nothing like getting kicked in the head by a woman. My wife's done it more than once. All right. Lift that leg up. Correct. Yes, and that's where you're talking about being able to fully flex into that position. He's obviously got some T-spine issues there as well. So if this was a, an overhead sport, that would be number one right there. You'd be able to look at that and go, got some other extra things. Downward dog. Lift that other leg. And swing that rascal through. 
All right? Athletes will compensate too. They'll pick that hand up and they swing it through. Well, coach, my leg's flat. My foot's flat on the ground. Yeah, you brought the other hand up. Hand has to be down. You got to be able to swing that leg through. I'm going to kick this TV. Be careful. There you go. Sometimes the athletes will readjust their hands or their feet to try to do what they need to do. Wherever you do your push up, right into it, hands and feet are where they're at, right into that position. Excellent, excellent. Pretty good. Good core strength with my man there. That was awesome. But we need to look at working on hip mobility, right? We need to look at, obviously, some extensibility back here in the, uh, in the soleus there. Most of my athletes, that's where the stiffness or the lack of extensibility there is at, which has a huge impact in terms of the ability to be able to decelerate for the anterior tibias, anterior there, to be able to rotate tibia fibia to be able to rotate and really have this anterior posterior lateral posterior medial ankle action and, and Lauren talked about it in his talk I mean it's the ankles doing all sorts of stuff it's working sagittal transverse frontal it's working the whole time and if that doesn't have the mobility there guess what it goes up through the kinetic chain and so what I've seen a lot is if I work again more down here from the knee down it usually cleans this up it's just like a car if I got bad shocks and struts what happens Car's gonna be out of alignment, those types of things, it's gonna work in the car and they're gonna end up ruining the car. Same deal with the human body, okay? And so I like to say I got this great car and I put a bigger car engine in it and I build it up, high octane fuel, all this stuff, and then I let the air out of the tires. Is that car gonna be able to handle right? No. Got a bigger engine though, and eventually it's probably gonna end up crashing, so it's the same premise, all right? Those are all the things we're looking at as we as we do these. So next one, quad table reach. So obviously we're again, agonist antagonist from the balancing leg, look at the hamstring. We're looking at the extensibility here in the quad. I always go right, opposite hand, opposite foot. Why do I go opposite hand, opposite foot? This question always gets asked, so I'll go ahead and tell you. Because this is easy. This is a little bit more true, stays true to the form. Pushing the foot against the hand, Again, we're gonna hip hinge, reinforcing hip hinging, reaching out into this position here, and stepping. How well can you get out into this table position, pushing that leg up, and getting out into there? All right, you guys ready? What's that? Yeah, well, you know, I'm a big believer, and you gotta at least be able to do it if you're gonna tell them to do it, I guess. I just do it, when I tell them to do the jumping stuff, mine just, I don't get off the ground as well. Uh-oh, you okay? okay? All right, we found a flaw. <laughs> you are human. Great job. Awesome. See what's going on here with the foot, though, when she's having to stabilize there? Some proprioception going on. Pretty good on your left side, but your right one needs a little bit of work, and that's okay. Again, this is why we do these things. So we're not just looking exclusively at this area. We're looking at that ankle strength and stability. It's really important. What's going on down there? Ready? Go. When my athlete can't even bend down and grab his foot, that's when I know I got some problems right here. But you're feeling that, right? Yeah. All right. My man. Push that foot against your hand, though, too, so that'll help balance you out a little bit and get you out into that position. No, none at all. You feel any pressure on your knee there? No, not at all. You're going to fill it up in the psoas. You're going to fill it up into the, into the quad. That's where you're mostly going to feel that, that stretch at. So it's be like, if you've ever seen anybody do like a standing rectus stretch, where they put their foot up here behind them and like they flex on a box, you're going to get that same thing. No pressure on the knee whatsoever when they do that. No real pressure on the low back. Right? No pressure on the low back either. Nope. Because you're hinging at the hip. If you're feeling pressure in the lower back, you're either doing it wrong, you got something probably, you probably aren't going to get cleared in the first one. There you go. 
And again, how is this hip hinge action happening? How is it working? How's the balance in leg? Is it bending as we go into hip flexion? Some tightness here. Try to push that foot against the hand. Push that foot, push, and then as you reach out, see if you can do that. See if that improves it. I don't have a problem cueing athletes up because so they say, well, aren't you teaching them to test? Well, no, if they can't do it, they can't do it. And if you coach them up on what they're doing and they're still not able to do it, then you know for sure what? There's something wrong. Sometimes you just give a, an athlete a visual cue, well, then they go, oh, okay, they fix it and they're aware of it. Great job, great job. All right, guys. Same chair, same spot. Good to go. All right, twisting triangle lunge, okay? I like this, I like doing the lunges and stuff because you'll see a lot of things with the kids too in terms of their tightness here. So this kind of reinforces it. So I actually will do this one backwards. So we'll just step backwards here, all right? And then be able to come up into this position. So there's a, there's a little bit of a teaching piece with this obviously, but I want the back foot to be at a 45. That's actually gonna pull my hips here. I'm going to stretch out that psoas. So I'm here, reaching up tall, coming down. I'm going to roll and twist, roll and twist, come back down, pop up. Backward lunge, here, twist, twist, pop back up. Don't swing the arm, you're almost kind of like you're unrolling yourself as you come up. All right, my man, you may not be able to get down to the ground, so just grab where you can, where you're comfortable, and how well you can do it. If the arms prove to be too difficult, you have an athlete that really struggles with this, have them just put their hands on their hips and then twist and open up. Try to put your ear over your knee when you're twisting on both sides. You guys ready? You're excited about this one. Come on. Backward lunge. Good, coming up. It's almost like uh, warrior, when you're in that warrior one, there you go, good. Can you tell I borrowed some stuff from uh, yoga? Okay, tall, over that front straight leg. Come all the way down, now twist and reach up. Good, twist and reach up the other way. Pretty good T-spine mobility right there, kids. Back down, lunge. You guys are back to superpower mode, good job. All right, my man's up right here. Broga, <laughs> Broga, yeah, yeah, that's my lineage, yeah, no, no, um, no namaste in my, in my uh, yoga gym, it's a lot of yelling, yeah, so, yeah, so obviously looking at some, really being able to have some extensibility here, what I say IT band, but you guys know what I'm talking about, being able to bend over actively right there and have the T-spine and that work together to be able to reach up again. It's a great exercise to do if I'm working with overhead sports, how well they're able to dynamically flex and rotate into those positions, right? I may not do this per se with a team that's not an overhead. I may not even do this one. I have a completely different one. I think I've got it up here, and if it's not, we'll, we'll go over it. I think I've got plenty of time. You guys see the movements, see the limitations with the athletes. Lots of times they'll compensate too with their, by bending that front knee to get down. With your back foot, watch the back foot, make sure that that's at a 45. Some of your athletes like to be at a 90, 45. I worked at Georgia Tech prior to Clemson, that's an engineering school. So I thought, man, that's gonna be really easy for me to tell kids 45 degrees, this and that. Didn't help, had, had no, I was like, I wouldn't let you guys build me a doghouse. You don't even know what a 90 degree angle is. So, excellent. And you'll see athletes sometimes compensate with this too. In order to get that twisting motion, they'll, they'll get out here and they'll do it because that's much easier, right? Again, ear over the knee. It's kind of a good cue to keep them honest. Great job. Excellent. Correct. Well, yeah, absolutely. Any sort of a rotational type sport, yeah, which is really not rotational, it's anti rotation, but yes. Great job, guys. 
See my man right here, he's got his hand on the outside edge, that's another way to, to compensate, hands always on the inside edge of the foot when we're doing that. Excellent, good job, all right? Next one. Oh gosh, well, we've got some more. I've got time and we'll go over. Let's go back here. So, you guys are great, thank you all, awesome job. Give him a hand. Good work guys, good job. Good way to be a good sport, brother. Great job, man. Great job. Okay, so in terms of looking at some, some couple of other things that I've added in over the years that, uh, that's not in the presentation, but we'll get into it at 1 o'clock is how can I look at, again, some lower quarter stuff with the athletes? All right, how can I build that right into the workout? So. One of the things is we're going to look at big toe, mobility. Now I know there's nothing sexy about a big flexible toe. You know, you can't, uh, doesn't look good with the, with, with the shirt with no sleeves on. But it's so important in terms of our ability to be able to accelerate and push off. If I lack the extensibility in the big toe, and a lot of my guys, for whatever reason, have, you know, they wear some guy's shoes that don't fit them, and a lot of them got bunions. Like that, that big toe is pushed underneath here. Okay, so there's a lot of, lots of times we have some big toe, greater toe issues that are going to affect our ability to accelerate up and down that court. So if my big toe, if I can't push off in that position, the heel's going to spin out. So one of the things we do is a lunge and reach. And so with that, all I'm simply doing is lunging, pulling, pulling across. Now I'm actively dynamically going on this side, of the opposing side of the body. But I'm most importantly, too, I'm looking at my big toe. And you'll see athletes that have big toe problems do this. Their heels will spin out. Make sense? So I didn't have to pull out an ergometer and get it into, oh, you have 40 degree range of motion flexion there. Just looking, see how you're going to move. Looking at the heel, seeing how that heel, that heel's spinning out. If not, when we're doing that movement, good to go. If not, it's kind of like, just kind of really kind of like a pass or fail. And so that's a really, really good way to be able to look at, hey, do, do we have some greater toe issues? All right. Another one is just standing. And I'll have the athletes here up on the balls of their feet, and I'll just have them stand. Come from the next one up on the toes, pick that foot up, stand. Do they have the soleus stiffness, the ability to be able to drive through the ground and propel themselves there? Lots of times you'll see the guys here. You go up on one toe, they get the heel drop. They lack the strength and the stiffness back there. So we'll do some isometrics with them, five, five second holds, build that up, cleans it right up, and then that allows us to work into more plyometric type stuff, deceleration stuff, as we bring that, that body up to speed. Um, and then with the lunge and reach, if I have an overhead sport, then I'll get into the cardinal core. Lunge and reach. Folding the body over here to the side, twisting towards here, and then around, reaching both hands. A lot of athletes just kind of want to throw it back there. I'm like, no, touch the ankle, reach back, just like so. And then pulling across, twisting around. So that's a really good way for you to be able to, again, look at the flexibility in the core and like your rotational sports, obviously you kind of want them to be compliant, like a snake slithering. But the moment that they are ready to strike or make that impact, boom, you want them to be in like really, really taunt. Does that make sense? So that's a really good way to kind of fuse multiple sports. If you're in a high school setting, I'm sure you got baseball players working with football players. You see all they have the time slot. It's a really quick way for you to kind of do that and do a quick assessment. Like, hey Johnny, do the do the hand thing there, whatever you want to call it, and you kind of get an assessment. And as you improve that, the, the nice thing about doing this is, again, the rate of frequency from which you can do it. Some of these movements you guys probably have already done. You've seen them, but have you thought about them in this context? The inchworm, the push-up, putting them in this fashion. So what it allowed me to do is every single day that we come into the weight room, we do a dynamic warm-up. And I can see how well my athletes are progressing 
and I'm really able to assess the kinetic chain at a high, high rate of frequency. We are prescribing corrective exercises as active recovery sets between our compound multi-joint movements. So we build that into the workout. So athlete A is squatting, athlete, a, athlete B excuse me, is spotting, and athlete C is on the floor doing a corrective. Then when A's done, now he's doing the corrective. B squatting, C spotting. It's a real simple way to put it into your program and not compromise what you're already doing, training time. Time is the most precious commodity as a strength coach. Don't need a bigger weight room, don't need more weights, just need more time. And so my hope is that what you guys are able to do from this is glean, hey, this is a, a way, this is some stuff that I can do, that I can build and put into my program. Um, I developed a, I have an entire website dedicated to this, I have an entire system. Um, we actually have stuff uh, where if you see where these are at, we have over 80 different corrective exercises that you can apply. And you get to see my face on those. I'm sorry. I can't afford models. And, uh, but we have that on there and it just prints it up on an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper. I just take a magnet and I put it up there. And so one of the things is, lots of times is, we see something wrong, but how do we fix it? A lot of people do the FMS test. Well, he didn't, didn't score well. Okay. What do you do with it? Well, this you're able to do something with. This gives you kind of a, 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 a point from where which to go. We're all coaches, we're smart enough. You got hamstring flexibility issues, what are you gonna do? Gonna work on that. But anytime we improve range of motion, we gotta remember that we wanna increase stability and strength too in that range. Because if we just increase the range of motion without the stability and strength, we're, we're setting ourselves up for injury, okay? So anytime you improve range of motion, you got to increase strength and stability, right? So again, if I'm working with an athlete and it's, uh, we're going to be doing predominantly a lower body work that day, then I'm going to work in as active recovery, mobility exercises that are specific to the quads, TFL, hamstring, okay? I'm going to build that in because I'm increasing the range of motion and then I'm reinforcing it with the exercise as part of that stability, of that strength. If I'm working more upper body stuff, then we're going to do more T-spine stuff. All right? Uh, and I try to build those in so I'm in develop when I'm increasing range of motion, I'm increasing strength and stability. Does that make sense? Cool. Any other questions? Yes? I can't hear you. I'm sorry. What I, what I do with an athlete that can hyperextend? <sighs> Mostly stability in, that, in those exercises I'm gonna end up doing with them. I mean, where, where's, you know, if it's not causing any problems and they're hypermobile, I mean, that's, that's just what they are. It's like, well, we're just gonna work on stability and that, making sure that we strengthen through that range of motion. But nobody's really, if, like some people say, well, they can hyperextend their knee. Are they ever really gonna do that when they're running? They're not going to be like running, hyperextending their knee. So they're never really going to put themselves in that situation, that precarious. They may be hypermobile, which is fine, but obviously what do we want to do? We want to strengthen in that particular sense. Does that, make, does that answer your question? So getting them strong there. And some, some kids are hypermobile, so what do we want to do? We want to make them a little more stiffer. We want them a little more stiff. Like my guys, lateral reactive, a lot of anterior chain work, accelerating, decelerating. So they're... I kind of want them a little tight. I don't need them to have this great quad stretch. I mean, I, if I can get up, it looks decent. If they can hip hinge and get into a good position, I'm okay with that. They don't have to be like, you know, looking like the, you know, Superman, okay, and then in this position here. And a lot of my guys, hamstring wise, they're just, because they accelerate, decelerate, re accelerate, they're never really getting into top end speed. So they're never having to pull with the posterior chain a whole lot. So flexibility there, what is okay? And, it, and again, I don't subscribe to a one, two, three scale. It's just your coach. You look at that, how well are they moving? How well are they actively engaging in the exercises you're giving them? Can you improve that? Most certainly. And some of that just a therapeutic too, by being able to increase that range of motion there for them, give them a little bit of relief. But if usually if that's messed up, then there's something going on downstairs from the knee down. Other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, going back to that sheet that you showed earlier, you kind of just touched on it, but are you making any particular notations or things that help you remember? 
remember how certain athletes are moving in certain areas? Yeah, so the, the sheet that I had up here, let me put that back up here. So this is just a sheet, and I don't know what happened to the fonts on this. I, they're all kind of funky, but I have all my, basically just took my kinetic chain. And I said, I want to look at foot stability, ankle mobility, stability, knee stability. I'm looking at those things, and I'm just putting them in my chart here. And then so as you've got the pers person's tester name, I've got a laser here, ah, look at that, right here. I put the date when it is, and I'm just checking off. It's like, oh, he's got some ankle issues here. Looks pretty good here on some strength, but mobility issues here. And I'm hitting that. And at the end of it, you can tally that up, and you can say, I want to do something individually for this athlete if you have that luxury to be able to work on one-on-one -on -one clients, or I'm going to look at it and say, what's globally wrong with my team? Or globally wrong with session A? And we're going to work on those. And then the one thing is with this test is the kids immediately feel the tightness. Where'd my man go? You felt that right up, yes. okay? Right off there. That's amazing. Like, like one of the compliments I get, it's like, coach, it's like I can tell, I can feel, right? So there's total buy-in with that. Like, I don't... After most of my kids do other movement screen tests, it's kind of like, all right, what does that number mean, coach? What's going on? Like, you put them in a downward dog heel raise, they know what's wrong. They feel it. And then immediately, that's an easy buy-in. Like, I got to work on that. I don't even feel right, coach. So um, that's the sheet. Does that, does that answer your question? And you can make that up simple for yourself, too. Yeah. Um, one of the other things that I do too, if somebody wants to do this, just add in one exercise. Just put it in there and just learn it. You master it and then master it to your athletes, that one exercise. One of the things we end up doing is we have foundation, uh, str uh, foundation linear work. We have foundation agility work. And those are part of our warm-up. So I'm going to do a dynamic inchworm down and then I'm going to come back and I may do a heavy bag march coming all the way back down here. Then I may come back here doing a bend over straight leg, and then I'm gonna do a one, two skip, coming back. So you're able to build that. It's obviously a linear progression in there. Do the same thing going down here, and now I'm gonna be working on the agility part as they come back. So again, it's a way for you to even increase, obviously, the warm up, the dynamic part of that and it helps reinforce the foundations of the movements from which we want to be building everything upon. From a linear speed mechanic, from a, an agility mechanic position. So it's again a way for you to utilize your time really effectively. Yes? Yes. Uh, I do RDL, where do I go? So why, the question was, why don't I have the athletes go down and touch the floor on the hip hinge? I, I, I don't do deadlift like this. I just work on the hip hinge. And what am I really looking at there? Hip flexion. So I don't, I don't need to, I, I just think it's, uh, I used to do it and I kept, kept started kind of thinking about it. I'm like, why do they need to do that? Like at the end of the day, what am I looking at? Stability and being able to hinge in this position. If you can do that, you're going to be successful in sport, you know? If you can do that and touch the floor, you're just showing off. <laughs> Other questions? Awesome. Oh, yep. Do you ever, uh, for sake of time, do you ever have them just do it stationary in one place? Absolutely. Yeah, we'll do it on the court. So, so we do like everybody wants to auto regulate everything now, right? Nonlinear periodization, auto regulate based on how that. Why don't we just auto regulate their mobility? So we, got, we usually break the teams up, so I've got a group of guys going. They're, usually the guards are out there. Well, then I've got the other team, the bigs or the wings or whatever, and I'm putting them through these DW. I'm looking at them like, got some, got some issues there. Hey, you, go do, uh, go do these exercises over there on the set. So I got a bag of stuff. So I'm able to instantly be able to see that. Again, what are we doing in a car race? We are evaluating and assessing and prepping seconds leading up to that race, minutes. Why can't I do the same thing with my athletes? And this allows me to be able to do that with a quick iteration like that right on the court and uh, works out really well. That's it?
Awesome. Thank you guys for your time. I really appreciate it. Hope to see you at one.